Ahoy, and welcome to the Jolly Reader. I'm your host, Captain Book. Thanks for joining me again. So just full disclosure, I'm sick right now, and my husband and I were tested for COVID yesterday, so I won't know for a couple days, but either way, I don't feel so good, and my voice probably sounds extra manly, and I'm probably going to take a week off next week from uploading a video, just because I don't feel great, and I don't know how well recording will go, but for today, we will be going over Truly Devious Part 3 by Maureen Johnson, and if you're following along, it's chapters 22 through 30, pages 304 through 416. We finish the book today. So, sorry in advance, this book ending is disappointing, but luckily, we'll be moving on to the second book, The Vanishing Stare. Also, this episode is going to be kind of short. Really not a lot happens. I have way less notes than I usually do, so we'll just see about how long it ends up. So... Let's get into a summary of last episode. And if you haven't listened to it, as usual, go back. It's going to be really confusing if you're just starting on part three, obviously. So summary, 1930s with Albert Ellingham. So he does the second cash drop and there's a man on the boat that takes the money and he doesn't ever get his family back. We find out that Dottie's body was found in another location, not on the Ellingham campus. We also find out that Iris's body was found in water. I would assume the same water where they left the bunny, but I'm not sure. Flora, Leo, and Marsh are all interviewed by the police, and Albert's boat blew up with supposedly him and Marsh on it. Then, in present day with Stevie, Janelle's pass is stolen and used to take dry ice out of the workshop. Stevie, Maris, Nate, and Dash start filming Truly Devious Project for Hayes. They go into the tunnel that Dottie was murdered in. After filming, Hayes goes back to the tunnel and is found dead via dry ice. That was like our big, woo, crazy. Stevie's natural reaction is to make out with David, and Stevie's parents might pull her out of school. So there you go. Things to look forward to. Nothing. (laughs) That's what it feels like, but really, we find out what the deal is with David, and it's super disappointing, and we maybe find out who wrote the truly devious letter, and we find out that Stevie's ridiculous. Oops, we already knew that. So I guess the best thing to do is just to get started. Chapter 22. So we start with Stevie, and she's on the Ellingham coach, and the coach stops at a rest stop in Burlington, but she's meeting her parents at the rest stop because they want to talk to her about the murder, the death, it's not considered a murder, and potentially pulling her from school. So, of course, David shows up to get on the coach as well, and he's super dressed up, like collared shirt, all sorts of things. So he shows up all dressed up, and she's like, what the heck? And she jokes about him going for a job interview. And he's like, "Uh, no, I just like to look nice for the Burger King, making a joke. But she also at one point asked if he's meeting his parents. And he's like, oh, hell no. So then while they're on the coach, he asked if Stevie wants to talk about what happened between them, a.k.a. the makeout sesh. And she says no. And she has enough to worry about with her parents potentially pulling her from school. So she doesn't want to deal with it. He says life always finds a way and then puts on his headphones. Does this sound oddly familiar like the bus ride between boring Nicole and Chase? Because that's all I can think of. Anyways, they get to the rest stop and David gets off the coach too, which surprises Stevie because she thinks he's going to Burlington, which would make sense. And he just like walks up to her parents and introduces himself and says, oh, Stevie told me I could get a ride into Burlington with you. And they're all ecstatic because Stevie's talking to a boy. So they invite him to go to lunch and Stevie is actually in my opinion reasonably fuming about this and the thing that's super annoying though is she talks about being poor like the whole time and wanting to be like a smart mouth to her parents it's super annoying i don't know why she cares it's ridiculous so they go to lunch david insists on paying big who cares okay so the main points of lunch is david says his mom's a pilot and his dad runs a fertilizer plant and cv takes that as him mocking them which is really weird and then he convinces her parents that Hayes' death was a terrible accident and they can't believe everything that the news tells them, and basically they have nothing to worry about. Bottom line, her parents are, like, totally in love with him, and Stevie's overly annoyed, whatever. So Stevie's parents announced to her that they've been asked by Edward King, the senator, to become the volunteer coordinators for the entire state. And Stevie says, that's great, even though it kills her inside, but she thinks if she's supportive, her parents will let her stay in school, which they do. 
Chapter 23. On the coach ride back, Stevie's mad at David. What else is freaking new? So he's like, I don't understand why you're mad. You said you want to stay in school and I helped you out. So you get to stay in school. And she wants to do it on her own. And she wants to stay not because her parents think they're dating. And he's basically like, who cares how you got the results you want? It's working out the way you want. So like, get over it. So then she like freaks out and she calls him a liar and it's like, those aren't really your parents' jobs. And he's like, obviously, we're both very sensitive about our parents. So let's just call it even and not talk about it. So I think they just put on their headphones, stop talking. And this part's so dumb. So she talks about his hands like a spider creeping towards her, but then the coach jostles and they don't hold hands. Like, who cares? Big who cares? Giant who cares? So anyways... Stevie goes back to Minerva and Janelle asks how the trip with her parents went and she tells Janelle she could stay in school. We know. So Stevie goes to her room and thinks about, she like looks in the mirror and thinks about how, why David would like her. And she's like, is this attractive? Is this what boys like? Am I attractive? Like waste of my time. Probably not Stevie. Probably not. Then she goes to David's room and they briefly talk about liking each other And basically the consensus is they're both messed up and that's why they should just try to be together. I don't, it's weird. So they start kissing. It's not like a full blown makeout thing, but it's way too detailed in the book. Picked knocks on the door and Stevie hides in the closet because they would feel awkward getting caught again by Picks. And Pick says that he needs to go to the Great Hall. Nothing's wrong. Charles just needs to talk to you about. And then David cuts her off and they leave Stevie in the closet. So that's like cliffhanger. Oh, what do they have to talk about? Who cares? So Stevie starts snooping around David's room, typical. And basically everything's nice quality, nice clothing or whatever, but nothing special. And then she opens up his laptop. And before she can look through it, David comes back and he's like, what are you doing? And Stevie's like, I just want to know your secret. Like, what's the deal with you and your parents? And he's like, my parents are dead. Now get out of my room. And I have my nose. Not sure if I believe that. Real talk, though, I have a dead parent and my husband has a dead parent, so nothing to joke about. (coughs) Anyways, so then we move on to the Federal Bureau of Investigation interview between Agent Samuel Arnold and Robert McKenzie, April 17th, 1936, 710 p.m. Location, Ellingham Property. Okay, per the interviews, we're going to run through the facts. So Robert's been working for Albert for eight years. They briefly talk about how they met. It's like not relevant to the story. The police talk about this being an organized crime and Robert's an organized man. And he's like, bro, it wasn't me, obviously. So then Robert says that Albert and Iris were very different people, as we already know from Flora and Leo's accounts. And you could tell she didn't like living up north in the school. She's like a socialite. And then they ask about Flora and he's like, no, she's like a sister to Iris. And then they ask about Leo and he's like, uh, he wasn't capable of something like that. He's a uh, drunk. So then they asked about the letters and Robert says that they get threats like this daily. And when he first saw the truly devious letter, he thought it was a joke because of the letter cutouts and stuff. And then he noticed that the letter was addressed to the Ellingham house on campus, not one of Albert's businesses, which would be like the normal. So this seemed more personal. So then the detective asked Robert where he thinks Iris and Alice are, and he says, God help me, I think they're all dead. Same-ish. I still think Alice might be alive. Still not confirmed that she's dead. Anyways, chapter 24. Ellie's having a whole breakdown over Hayes' death, and David won't talk to Stevie and is avoiding her. And basically, the school did a public announcement that Hayes' death was an accident. He went to film a segment in the tunnel with the dry ice for his new show, and Basically, what supports this is his fingerprints were on the golf cart and the hand truck that were used to move the dry eyes, also on the dry ice container and on Janelle's ID. All things that could have been planted or whatever, in my opinion. So Stevie talks to Nate and she talks about the riddle. It's just like a classic riddle about a man hangs himself in a room that's locked on the inside. There's no chair how did he do it it's a block of ice it melts same with like a stabbing the icicle melts perfect crime whatever not clever so basically she's saying to nate the whole death seems like a production like the truly devious letter and that hayes didn't do this to himself agreed so kind of like just putting this in here which this is not addressed at all 
my question is, if he went down there to film a segment and he accidentally died via dry ice, where's the video footage of him starting to film and or was there a camera found on him? Because that would say, yeah, that's that's what happened. But they don't talk about that at all. So just keep that in mind. Then Stevie talks to Gretchen, who's the queen bee, and she spills the tea. She tells Stevie that she worked all summer. I forget what she does. Something artistic anyways. And she gave Hayes $500. And that's like all she had from what she worked over the summer. And he never paid her back. And when they dated the previous year and she did like all his homework for him and she found out that four other people were also doing his assignments. He's like a classic narcissist. Like he asked her to do his midterm and she was like, wow, this is like going a little too far. And then he was like, baby, baby, I'm sorry. I asked you for too much. Like I'm going to suck up to you now. It's classic abusive situation. So anyways, she talks about a story about where her and Hayes and Ellie, and I'm not sure if anyone else was with them, but they were sneaking out and they got caught because someone was running patrol or whatever. And Hayes says to the security guard, oh, wouldn't it just be like a shame if someone found out that you were trying to sell us pot and they found pot in your car? Like basically threatening him to not tattle on them or he'd like plant pot and get the guy in trouble or whatever. So then Gretchen says the guard left three weeks later and she always wondered like what had happened about it. So then Gretchen's fed up. You go, girl. And she breaks up with him. But he already was like getting together with Beth, apparently. Then he does like this super gross thing. So she's in this room practicing piano and he comes in there and there's people in the room next door, but they can't see Gretchen and Hayes. And he makes this whole scene. He's like yelling and crying. He's like, I can't believe you cheated on me and saying all these false claims that she didn't do to make her seem like a villain. And then he like winks at her and walks out like a douchebag. Stevie asks about the zombie video and she's like, yeah, he definitely didn't do that himself but she doesn't say that she did it she just says she knows that he wasn't responsible for it and then she asks if stevie is with david and stevie says no and gretchen was like oh because i was gonna be like good luck with that same z's chapter 25 my notes say all things we already know z buckle up so pix is getting ready to pack up Hayes's room for his parents but first she has to go to a meeting which is super convenient so then stevie has the opportunity to go search his room six pages later we confirm that he didn't write the zombie show shocker like basically she gets on his computer and there's time dates via email of when he sent the idea for the zombie show And it confirms that it was while he was in school, not after a two-week vacation on summer break, like he said. So this conclusion is that someone at the school wrote it for him, I guess. Whatever. While she's going through Hayes' room, she overhears David talking on the phone to someone named Allison. And she thinks it's a girlfriend, but like, can we talk about how Alice is short for Allison? That seems like the most obvious thing, but... They don't ever bring that back around this book, so we'll see. Then Stevie goes into David's room and apologizes for snooping, and he's not having it. And Stevie insinuates that Hayes' death was a murder, and he basically calls her weird and says she's being inappropriate for making a hobby out of a classmate's death, which I totally agree. And then she leaves because she doesn't want David to see her cry, but she's a real detective, and no one's going to tell her otherwise. Foot stamp out the door whatever. So then the next little section is the bat report. That's Jermaine's blog or whatever it is. And it's just headlined internet star dies in school accident. So that's obviously Hayes. We don't really learn anything new. And she basically just writes that there's a theory that he left dry ice overnight. And then when he went back to film it, the dry ice had melted, which would cause carbon dioxide. And he died from asphyxiation from it. I guess now is a good time just to get into it. So my husband was Googling asphyxiation and dry ice and stuff. So he Googles it. And what we found was a case where someone waited for their husband. I think I could be a little off, but for them to fall asleep and then they left the dry ice and shut all the windows and doors. And then while the person was sleeping over the eight hours, the dry ice melted and they suffocated in their sleep. So that's kind of the theory behind this. But what doesn't make any sense at all is like, even if you left this overnight or whatever, 
and then Hayes went back and he walked in the room. I don't know if I already said this, but Larry tells her that he would die instantly or he at least passed out instantly and then died shortly after from suffocation, fixation, whatever. So the theory is it was left overnight. He walks in there. He immediately is knocked out as soon as he gets in the room. That's not how it is. You would feel like, oh, I'm feeling woozy. I better leave this tunnel and go like feel better in the fresh air. It's just stupid, poor writing. Back to We Were Liars. Anyways, chapter 26. This needs to pick up time now. It's in my notes. So here we are. Stevie's in the attic doing her assignment and she's watching videos of Hayes' zombie thing. I don't know. She's obsessing. It's being really weird. She talks about Albert's last riddle which, as we recall, is where do you look for someone who's never really there, always on a staircase, never on a stair? And she can't figure it out, but my husband is. And if you follow me on Instagram, you would know that. So after I recorded last episode, I talked to my husband about this and I was like, what do you think the riddle is? And he said, is there some sort of family portrait above the stairs? Because something that's always on a staircase, never on a stair could be hanging on the wall, which even Stevie mentions that in this part, it could be hanging on the wall. And when she first goes to school and on the tour, there's a huge family portrait of Albert and Iris. And I'm not sure if Alice is in it, but it's definitely at least the two of them. And it's hanging above the stairs. So where do you look for someone who's never really there? Well, they're dead or gone or whatever. And they're always on a staircase, but never on a stair. They're hanging on the wall of the staircase. It's figured out. She can't figure it out. She's an idiot. My husband's a genius. End of story. So, oh, this was the part I was talking about, Officer Larry. Okay, so she talks to Officer Larry, and he's like, it's a miracle we didn't die when we found him. Luckily, the door was propped open, so the carbon dioxide wasn't still in there as much. Like I said, that's not how that would have happened. But they say that Hayes died almost immediately once he got down there. Wouldn't have happened that way, but we're going to go along with how the book is. So Stevie gets a hold of Beth Brave, which is Hayes' girlfriend, kind of, the famous YouTube girl, under the pretense that she's putting together a memorial video. And Beth tells her that both her and Hayes agreed to see other people when they weren't in LA. So she knew about Maris and it was no big thing. So then Beth tells Stevie that she always talked to Hayes late at night. So Stevie's like, well, what time? And she says, I, she gives a timestamp, but it's, it's during the time that the dry ice was stolen with Janelle's ID. So basically he couldn't have done it because he was on video chat with Beth. So she would have known, well, you're not in your room. You're stealing heavy dry ice. And she doesn't say anything about it. So no way. Obviously it was an accident. Tell me something I don't know. Chapter 27. Stevie doesn't feel like she can go to Larry yet because he told her not to play detective, but she literally has proof that he didn't take the dry ice and no one in books ever freaking go to the police and is dumb. So she makes a fact list, which I'll just read to you. Facts. Someone took Janelle's ID from the art burn when we were in yoga. Duh. Someone used the ID to get into the workshop at 1.12 the next morning. At the same time, seven pieces of dry ice were removed from the storage unit. She says pieces, but I thought it was a full bucket. I don't know much about dry ice, like how big it is or whatever, but I guess it's seven. Hayes' fingerprints were on the ID. Hayes was Skyping with Beth at the time. Hayes lied about the end of it all. That's the zombie YouTube. Strong possibilities. Hayes did not write the end of it all, at least not alone. Duh, I've been saying that for two episodes now. Conclusion. Hayes had the ID at some point, but he was not the one who went into the workshop. Also, duh. Questions. Why did Hayes turn around and go into the tunnel? Someone told him to meet him there. Clearly. Did he know the dry ice was there? Most likely not. Did he ask someone to get it for him? Probably also not. That's like her rundown. She's an idiot, but that's where we're at in this part of the book. Okay. So, side note, Janelle's mad at Stevie because earlier Janelle asked about, ooh, what's going on with David? And Stevie won't talk about it. So, Janelle's just been like, you're a crap friend. And she starts avoiding her and won't sit next to her at lunch and whatever. And we just wasted two episodes on Stevie being upset about losing the friendship. And now she doesn't even care. So, then, I don't know if I even mentioned this, but there's this weird, like, silent school dance thing at the main house. And Nate's like, dressed up even though he hates dances he's like stevie you gotta get out your funk you gotta go to this i hate dances but i'm doing this for you you're losing friends left and right like get up we're going to this and she's like oh if Hayes murders there i can get a look at everyone there so i guess i'll go and she makes a whole thing about it she's stupid i can't so she tells me that she has her whole theory about that Hayes was murdered and that she wants to solve it and she can't tell anyone yet and he's like we need to tell larry this is ridiculous no i have to solve the whole thing myself 
just tell an adult. I hate when stories do it. It's so unrealistic. I hate this. So now we're back in the 30s, August 13th, 1937. So long story short, Anton Voracek, a known anarchist, was found guilty of the kidnapping of Iris and Alice and the murder of Dottie and Iris. So we can kind of assume that he's the one that got beat up when the ransom money wasn't high enough. I'm also not convinced that he killed Dottie, but he got charged for it. So how he was found was he was spending a bunch of money and people knew he was not well off. So they were suspicious by why do you have a lot of money? And so the police searched his home and they found the money that was marked by the ink that Leo made. Also in his house, they found the child's shoe that was found on the mountain. Also can't confirm that that's Alice's, but whatever. The day before he was supposed to go to the electric chair, Albert, that's quick. (laughs) They do the trial and like next day he's supposed to get electrocuted anyways. So Albert visited him in his cell, which is like this makeshift area downstairs of the courthouse, whatever. Sorry, my voice is going in and out. I'm trying to push through this. So Anton says, why does it matter who I am? Your kind destroys my kind every day. And Albert's like, where's Alice? And Anton's like, I have nothing for you. Go away, old man. So it's a standoff for like a couple hours and then he leaves. We don't learn anything. So the next day of the execution, the police bring Anton around the front instead of the back like they had been during this whole situation. And their shots fired and Anton is murdered. So basically the main question is, did Albert hire a hit? Why would he do that if Anton was going to die the next day? It's kind of pointless. Like, why would anyone kill him unless they were worried right before he got executed that his last words would be like, so-and-so was in on this or something. So Anton's dying and Robert's like near him and Anton says, did not dot, dot, dot. Like we don't, he couldn't finish the sentence. <laughs> Chapter 28. So we're at the silent dance thing and they give everyone headphones to listen to music, but like obviously you can't talk to each other. And I can't tell if I hate this idea or like this idea. I was not a big school dance person, but this seems kind of cool. So Vi and Janelle are dancing together. They're basically a couple uh vi encourages janelle to interact with stevie and tries to make things okay they basically work it out it's not worth getting into then david briefly comes over and jokes around mostly with nate but he does talk to stevie for the moment so they seem to be kind of okay and then ellie doesn't acknowledge them at all but it seems like she's under the influence of some sort in my opinion dash and maris seem to be doing okay gretchen's still distraught but holding it together and jermaine's in the corner taking notes and such so stevie goes up to jermaine and she asks to see the pictures of like everybody the night they were filming before they went to dinner before hayes said i have to go back for something and he was working on his computer his laptop and his laptop's fine normal condition and when stevie was searching hayes's room she took pictures of his entire room and she noticed that his laptop had three scratch marks on it this is super dumb so when she was doing her assignment in the attic she scratched her hand and then janelle squeezed her hand while they were dancing and she was like scratch marks this reminds me of when i reached under the bathtub the first day i was at school so these scratch marks on this computer are the exact same and it has to be because someone shoved the computer under the bathtub it's supposed to be this whole wow that's a really crazy way to figure something out it's really super 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 dumb so she thinks someone tried to hide evidence that was on his computer so they shoved the computer under the bathtub and then wiped it and returned it to his room before police or whoever could look at it so basically it comes down to ellie and david because the other two are first years i don't really understand why she eliminates nate and janelle besides the fact that i don't think they did it but she's saying the motive is the zombie movie and someone wanted credit for it so they murdered him over it and it couldn't have been janelle and nate because they didn't go to school and they didn't know Hayes at that point it's still pretty flimsy so nate wants to go to larry about this because stevie tells him obviously he's basically robert mckenzie and all this and stevie is reckless albert so stevie says the police didn't get this far i got this far i can get rest of the way okay stevie you're 15 grow up okay So Nate pretty much says she's an idiot and she's going to get them killed. And this is dumb as well. Stevie wonders, they're walking back to Minerva, like the whole Minerva house. And Stevie wonders if she made out with a murderer and if that's why she was attracted to David in the first place. But she already, in two seconds later, she rules him out. So I don't even know why she would think that for five seconds when she already knows what she thinks. So 
at this point, I say, no, this is typical plot. It's clearly not David. And I'm not super convinced it's Ellie either. And it would be wild if it was Pix, but I don't think it's her either. So all of them walk back home and Nate's asked if Stevie has a plan. She's like, yeah, but you won't like it. Chapter 29. Stevie suggests a game of Never Have I Ever. I would explain it if it was relevant, but it's not. They play. It's dumb. Whatever. So then she randomly, which has nothing to do with the game. You think she'd trap her, but she doesn't. She randomly asks Ellie how much she paid for Ruta the saxophone. And Ellie says $500, which is convenient because that's how much that Gretchen gave Hayes. So Stevie concludes that she helped Hayes with the zombie YouTube. All this is really dumb as well because I don't know why Hayes even needs money if he's making money off this YouTube thing. So anyways... He's getting a movie deal, so she's like, you want credit for this. You helped him write it, and that's why he paid you the $500 or whatever. And Ellie admits to helping him write it, but she's like, I don't even want money. I just wanted Ruta. I used to live on a commune. You think I care about any of this? I don't even watch TV, which she doesn't even watch TV. How did she come up with a zombie idea? Someone answer me that. So anyways, Ellie says that Hayes did a lot of dumb stuff, but she's sad he's dead. And basically, it's ridiculous that Stevie's coming for her. And she walks out of the house, but Larry's standing at the door because Nate texted him just in case. Smart. So they're all taken to the main house. And Larry, Charles, and Dr. Quinn question Ellie. She admits that she helped with the zombie project. And I think she admits to taking the computer. That's a little fuzzy. And then she insists that she doesn't care about money. Like I said, none of this makes sense. And she also says that Hayes was dumb and... She doesn't know why she even paid attention to him. And she says, Hayes and his stupid ideas got him killed. And then Dr. Quinn kind of cuts her off and is like, we should probably get a lawyer before you even talk more about this. Smart. So everyone agrees. Ellie's like, no, I don't want to be here. You can't hold me. This is ridiculous. So they lock her into Albert Ellingham's office and, I don't know, go get her food or something. But we all know there's a secret passage from his office to the ballroom. So she does that. She goes out. And apparently this passage also leads to the basement, which is not talked about, which is super weird. And they discover she's missing shortly after and everyone's looking for her. October 30th, 1938. Robert talks to Albert before he goes on the bolt ride with Marsh that ends up blowing up. So Albert tells Robert his riddle is the riddle of the Sphinx and no one can solve it. It's the greatest riddle ever, even though my husband's a genius and already solved it. I'm like almost positive. So I'm gonna feel real dumb. That's not the answer. Anyways, Robert couldn't solve it. Robert's like, oh, do you want me to pack you a picnic lunch? And he's like, it won't be needed. And then he tells Robert to go enjoy the beautiful day because life's short, blah, blah, blah. All these things point to suicide or fake death or something. Robert even says that it felt like Albert knew he was going to die. And there's still no mention of if Marsh is dead. I think they faked their death or it was a suicide. Chapter 30. This might be the last chapter. It is. Okay, last chapter. They go down to the basement and they find the window propped open and a pile of boxes in the basement, meaning Ellie escaped, but it's like the wilderness. So they're worried about where she could go. But now it's daytime and the police are still out searching for her. Stevie's outside the main house. David comes out there to talk to her. He admits to being with Ellie until around midnight, the night of the dry ice, which he told the police, but he said that they weren't smoking weed. He just said that to Stevie to spice things up. I don't know if he was trying to impress her. I have no idea. It's super weird, but he said they were just talking and he wasn't like with her. He was like, just like hanging out with her. So Stevie asks if David knows what Ellie meant because she was saying weird stuff when the teachers were interviewing her and she said things like Hayes news things this whole place this whole place Hayes's idea and David's like I don't know what she was talking about that was really weird but I don't think there's any way that Ellie could do this agreed so then the police come back with a box of things because they went and searched Ellie's room at Minerva and they're now able to return back to the house. So David and Stevie decide not to be mad at each other. And in more interesting news, they decide to search Ellie's room, even though the police already went through it. And they're like, I'm going to murder the author. No, I'm not. But this is ridiculous. This is not even, I hate this. I hate this type of writing. Okay. They're in Ellie's room. The police have thoroughly searched it. They even note that by the going through the drawers and stuff. They're sitting on Ellie's bed and he's like leaning in to Stevie and Stevie leans back and her hand hits a tin box that you usually put tea in 
and it's red and stevie finds it but the police couldn't like really it took her two seconds and please thoroughly search i'm over it so anyways she opens this box and there's a poem and i'm gonna read it the ballad of frankie and edward april 2nd 1936 frankie and edward had the silver frankie and edward had the gold but both saw the game for what it was and both wanted the truth to be told Frankie and Edward vowed to no king. They lived for art and love. And then this next line's marked out. They unseated the man who ruled over the land. And then the rest is normal. They took, the king was a joker who lived on a hill and he wanted to rule the game. So Frankie and Edward played a hand and things were never the same. Okay, cool. So there's also pictures dated, like photographs, 11-4-35, so November 4th. 1935 and stevie basically describes it as a male and female teenagers that are cosplaying as bonnie and clyde because bonnie and clyde would have been really popular at that time then falls out between the pictures is a cutout from a magazine with the word us and it looks like the truly devious note like letters that could have been used in that and then I don't know. The magazine was clearly from the 30s as well. I don't know how she dated that if it's just a cutout of two freaking letters, but we got to make the story go on. So Stevie puts together that the kids were probably the two kids that Leo mentions in his interview because when the police were interviewing Leo, they were like, did any of the students stand out? And he mentions Dottie stood out. And then he also mentioned a male and female kids that were really intelligent and he says their hair color and stuff. So Stevie thinks it's them. He really says like two lines about it. I didn't even include it in the podcast. It's totally pointless. And he doesn't even care about the kids. But that's them. So basically, she thinks she has proof that the original Truly Devious letter was written by the students. Which I called. I said I thought it was students that did this. Anyways, so a helicopter lands on campus. And it's not like medical or anything. It has nothing to do with Ellie. And David runs out. And it's Edward King, the senator. And Stephen hates it. Because she hates Edward King, obviously. And David's like, you want me to help you stay in school or whatever? And he basically says that he got her parents that job to run the whatever for Edward King. And he's like, meet my dead dad. So Edward King is David's dad. <laughs> That's how the book ends. Boo. It isn't even a cliffhanger. I don't even know why I should read the other books. It's terrible. So I guess we'll get into my lingering questions. So where do we even go from here? Because here's how I feel about it. Even if we find out who truly devious slash the people involved in the kidnapping and murders are, shouldn't everyone be dead by now, just time period wise? And why does it even matter? And anyone who wanted justice is dead too. So who cares? Like, I feel like even this whole, oh, we figured out truly devious. It's kind of pointless. Like, yeah, it's nice to solve it, but there's no one left around to even care about it. So something we do care about is who killed Hayes, and I don't think it was Ellie. I don't. I really don't. There's nothing even pointing at it. They're trying to make it seem like it's Ellie, but it's not. And I don't know how we're going to do two more books if we're just like, it's Ellie. We told you in the first book. I think she knows things, and but she didn't do it. I don't think she's calculated enough, and I don't think she cares about getting credit for the movie. So even if she did do it, the motive is something else. I think she might be in love with Hayes, and they're supposed to be like the present day version of the two students that cosplayed as Bonnie and Clyde and they're trying to like take down the system or whatever, but it all went wrong. That's just my theory. Next question. Why does David's storyline with being the senator's son even matter? Because I do not care. And we all know Stevie's going to end up with him anyways. Next question. Why couldn't the police find the box? But Stevie could because it's not possible. And, but we have to have the main character solve the case. We all know, we all know. So to end this, I guess I'll just read the back cover of the next book, The Vanishing Stare, in typical dramatic Captain fashion. Get this book out. Also, side note, so I had only bought the first book at Books A Million. My husband picked it out, so thanks a lot, Josh. Anyways, then we found out that it was a trilogy while we moved, and there's not Books A Million around here, and it was going to be more expensive to buy them individually. So I went on Amazon, and I bought all three books again. So now I have an extra copy of Truly Devious. If anyone wants to suffer through it, I'll send it to you. Okay, back cover. Let's go. Oh, good. It starts with the riddle. Where do you look for someone who's never really there? The truly devious case, an unsolved kidnapping and triple murder that rocked Ellingham Academy in 1936, has consumed Stevie for years. It's the very reason she came to the Academy. But then, her classmate was murdered, and her parents quickly pulled her out of school. 
Stevie's willing to do anything to get back to Ellingham, even if it means making a deal with the despicable Senator Edward King. And when Stevie finally returns, she also returns to David, the guy she kissed, and the guy who lied about his identity, Edward King's son. But larger issues are at play. Where did the murderer hide away? What's the meaning of the riddle Albert Ellingham left behind? And what exactly is at stake in The Truly Devious Affair? The second novel of the Truly Devious trilogy in the New York Times bestselling author Maureen Johnson, the Ellingham case has more twists and turns and more passageways than Stevie can imagine. The case isn't just a piece of history. It's a live wire into the present. Okay, I have a couple questions about this real quick before I get into my closing. It says, the unsolved kidnapping and triple murder that rocked Ellingham Academy in 1936. Triple? Triple? Are we talking about... Is Albert's included in that? Because, like, obviously Dottie died and obviously Iris died, but we don't know anything about Alice. Also, now I'm looking, Albert didn't even die until 1938, so I want to know what this triple is. And I think it's stupid that they put it on the back cover, but they never talked about it in the book. Second of all, why do we care where the murderer hid away? I don't... That's not, like, ooh, bigger issues. Where did the murderer hide? Why do I care? That doesn't matter. I don't know. It's going to suck, but we're going to get through it and it's going to be funny. So... As always, thanks for listening. Sorry my voice was a bit raspy. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook at the Jolly Reader Podcast. Subscribe so you can instantly download the next episode. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, please leave a review to help other crewmates find the podcast. Share with everyone you know, but keep six feet in between when you share it because COVID ain't no joke. Stay tuned for your weekly dose of secondhand embarrassment via the outtakes, and I will talk to you next time where we walk the plank and dive straight into the vanishing stare. Until we sail again, this has been the Jolly Reader. Bon voyage. Hey, you made it to the outtakes. Let's do it. Testing. Is this going to record? Can't wait to edit out a million coughing noises because I'm sick. Okay, time to check it. My mic keeps sinking. Oh my goodness. Stay where I say. Anyways. Having mic issues right now. Okay. Well, they're on the... Why can't I remember what it's called? Steven goes, Steven, why do I always do that? So then she goes to Steve, or, and then Pixie, Pix, not Pixie. So she basically tells, I say basically a lot this episode. Basically, why do I keep saying basically? So anyways, <coughs> COVID cough. Okay. Let's hear. Okay. Anton for, for a check. <coughs> Ow. Viv and or Vi, not Viv. That's why she was attracted to Davy and the Davy. I am Allie, and you are with me 